On the Pool Pearl Podcast, episode number two, we're interviewing Richard Falk, a leading chemist in the pool and spa industry. Today, we're going to talk about communicable diseases and especially COVID-19. You're not going to want to miss this. Welcome to the Pool Pro Podcast. This is Michelle Cavanaugh and Dave Rockwell. Dave Rockwell. We have a wonderful guest today that I know very well, and many of you probably already know who he is. However, you may not know what his background is or all the things he has to offer. And for those that don't know him, you really want to get to know this guy in regards to the wonder, you know, the information that he has to offer because it can really help a pool service guy knowing some of the chemistry myths out there. He did a webinar with us at the California Pool and Spa Association, and it was very well received by the industry. And I think that the, the things he's gonna talk about today are things that are actually useful you, for you in the backyard. And that's what's important. That's what we wanna to bring to the table is usefulness and not just an interview with somebody, but actually usefulness in the field. So I'm gonna let Richard Falk talk about himself a little bit because I think as Dave says, you know, he's the, he's the man of mystery. Like who is this guy and how did he come into play in the pool industry? So Richard, can you just, Give us a little bit of background. I know we did that um, on the webinar as well, but I think it's important for people to know who you are and why you're in the pool industry and why you do what you do. Right. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this, uh, uh, doing this webinar. So uh, yes, I got started in this uh, about uh, in 2003 when I, um, we did a rebuild on a house, a new house, and put it in a pool. And that was the first swing pool that I had uh, had. And, um, and I uh, had a friend in the industry, actually, uh, working at a chemical uh, manufacturer. Uh, so I was actually getting all the chemicals for free because he, he had a certain allocation for his use and such. that, And he uh, didn't have a pool himself. So, um, so he was sending everything to me and I was following all the instructions based on the labels and what traditional industry advice said to do. And, um, you know, that included use of trichlor tabs, but it had many other products as well, uh, extra things with it, enzymes and clarifiers and such. Uh, and, uh, and algicides as well. And uh, I ran into problems with my pool about a year and a half later uh, in 2004, uh, started to get dull, cloudy, uh, had unusual higher chlorine demand. I had to keep putting more trichlor pucks in. And then uh, at that time, I didn't understand what was going on. So um, I had a background in uh, chemistry and, uh, and physics in school that I really didn't use as much because I went into more computer science in terms of my uh, work. Um, but you know, it, it, given the issues I had in, in uh, the swimming pools, I realized, you know, oh, this must be, you know, chemistry and biology going on. I should look it up, figure out what's going on. And I went online and ran into a forum called the Pool Forum that a guy named uh, Ben Powell was running. And he originally did those sites, Pool Forum and Pool Solutions, originally did them for uh, the pool service community because he was doing uh, commercial pools himself. And... Uh, uh, but he found that there were more people in the residential pool market, residential pool owners, who were having problems just in terms of the, the quantity of number of people is larger, the number of pools in the residential site is larger. Uh, and so he shifted the focus of his site uh, to help them. So I went on that site and I read what he was writing and it was different advice than what the standard pool industry advice was. So I think educating our, our service industry raising that level is one thing um but i, I would really hope that uh, the model aquatic health code would start to look at the design of pools because a lot of pools are way under designed for the actual bather load on a saturday afternoon yeah, yeah. um they're under filtered the they if you're gonna have a, a public pool or a commercial pool you have to have a chlorine dosing system. You can't have a guy coming by a couple of weeks and dosing by hand. You can't have the uh, maintenance personnel come and dump a gallon of chlorine in there while people are swimming. The, these pools have to be set up right from the beginning. Yep. And, and then yeah. the, the, third, the, the third thing that's kind of coming together in my mind after having this discussion with a few different people is we need to educate the bathers. People get in without showering. People get in when they're sick. People, um, yeah. There's an online picture that gets circulated around the pool service 
Facebook pages of a woman shaving her legs in the pool. I mean, people do disgusting things in a public <laughs> pool. <laughs> and so, yes. you know, we need to educate people. Stop that. You know, maybe maybe the whole thing with this um, uh, virus, yeah, coronavirus, panic, yeah. coronavirus thing that's going around. Is hey, 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 hey. I think you're right. It's going to raise it's going to raise awareness. People are starting to think about communicable diseases more, and uh, the you know the importance of say hand washing in the case of the virus transfer and things like that. I think is is going to have people start thinking of behavior behavioral changes uh, to live more in a more healthy way in a community, and yeah. that includes the swimming. Now, swimming is has different aspects to it as you point out, because there's fecal to oral transfer there primarily. And that is, means a different area to clean, but it's still cleaning. It's still the, once you have the idea of keeping yourself clean, whether it's washing your hands, well, you know, cleaning your bum before, well, cleaning all of you to also get the, um, a lot of the sweat off and reduce the chlorine demand, which is not really as much of a health concern, but at least it, it does reduce the disinfection byproducts that could be produced, for example, because you have less of the precursors involved. So there are advantages to doing that, to being clean throughout. Uh, but I think that is true. That's going to be something. And I think, and, and while we're talking about COVID-19, let me, because this question has come up, uh, the CDC, C CMAHC, uh, uh, asked me about it too. So I did some calculations on it and sent that out. Um, you know, in terms of safety and because people ask about does it transmit through the water and this and that. And so, um, and uh, so the net result is that uh, the, the COVID-19 virus is, uh, there's a paper that shows that it's, um, it doesn't show it, it shows SARS actually because they, or shows coronaviruses because they don't have it for COVID-19. So assuming it's similar to other coro coronaviruses, which it probably is, um, that it is killed actually faster than chlorine, at least when they were looking at it in sewage. Uh, they didn't have anything in swimming pools, you know, so you just got to use what you can get as far yeah. as papers go. But it's better than nothing. And um, but it and and it and it's the type of virus coronavirus has is is what's called an uh, an enveloped virus. Uh, it has an envelope uh, around it, uh, which is which makes them uh, actually uh, easier to uh, kill because if you disrupt the envelope, then you uh, remove the surface. Um, proteins that actually do the attachment to the cells and such. So you don't even actually act, have to destroy the RNA inside in order to kill the, or inactivate the virus. Um, and that's why soap and water is so effective, for example, because soap just goes in there and, and um, uh, disrupts that uh, uh, encapsul uh, encapsulation um, uh, uh, piece. And, and the envelope, actually, it's not encapsulation, the envelope. Um, Alcohol does that too. Alcohol does it in a different mechanism, but similar um, in terms of dissolving. So hand sanitizers work. Right. And so now, so hypochlorite uh, does both. Hypochlorite both attacks the proteins in that uh, envelope wall and it attacks the RNA. So it's a twofer. Uh, that's why hypochlorite works well, even for the non-envelope viruses like norovirus and stuff, whereas these other things aren't as, as good. Alcohol is not as good for that. Um, Anyway, so getting back to COVID-19 in, in, in pools. So the good news is, is that it kills, uh, it looks like it's killed even faster than E. coli and E. coli is killed pretty darn fast. Uh, the, the bad news or the downside or the counter is that uh, when I looked up the um, uh, dose response uh, and the uh, fecal amount, uh, the, the, the concentrations in fecal matter, the concentrations in fecal matter were lower than an E. coli, which is also, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, the bad thing, though, that countered all that was the dose response. Uh, it turns out it takes a significantly lower dose of virus of COVID-19 than E. coli to get sick or to get infected, right? Um, so the net of it all is, is that it is uh, worse than E. coli. Uh, but the good news is, is that when we ran our models and we're doing fecal sloughing models last, you know, the, for a paper, uh, E. coli was pretty much the easiest one to to get rid of. So even though it's worse than E. coli that way, it's still low. Um, and, uh, and, and even the worst case shedder, the one that had the, the highest concentration, because you know, there was a study. So the one that had the worst highest concentration, uh, and if we assume the highest concentration of fecal matter that people are, uh, have, because we have that range also from uh, some experiments and studies that were done, uh, other people's experiments. Um, what we even that worst case gets it maybe up to the one percent kind of a range for standing next to somebody within one and a half feet for two hours, you know, which is not likely. 
Um, and that's that's for ingestion from the mouth from their from from fecal uh, sloughing. Um, if you're going to stand next to somebody in a pool for two hours, you're way more at risk from them have you know coughing over the air over the pool than you are from the fecal. <laughs> so so and that is the bottom line. So the bottom line with COVID nineteen. So the simple way to explain it, rather than having to go through all the detail, but I love detail and some people do, so that's why I explain it. But that way, but the, the simple way of uh, of explaining it is is that. Uh, the main risk in a swimming pool is the same risk as on land. If you're if you're crowded, the air transfer, the transfer over the air is above the water, is right. where the risk is, right? The risk isn't so much in the water. It's not that there's no risk in the water, but that pales in comparison. So if you stay away, and, and you, you know if you do social distancing even in the pool, you're you know at least three feet, preferably you know preferably six feet away. Uh, you'll be fine in the, you know, you, you'll be lowering the risk significantly in the air. And that, by the way, also lowers the risk in the significantly with the fecal to um, oral transfer as well, because chlorine has more time to kill it. And it's diluted also because there's further distance for the water. So basically it becomes a non-issue that way too. So, uh, so yeah, so people don't have to worry about swimming pools from a, you know, being an incremental risk. Yeah. They need to look at swimming pools in the same way as they look at uh, uh, being above ground, right? It's all about a matter of uh, how crowded you are and, and whether you're with a potentially infected person. And that, you're probably going to get angle. in the locker room. It's probably going to be in the locker yeah. room or the, you know, something like that versus the pools where you're going to get infected if you yeah, do. Yeah, if you're in well, a yeah. commercial yeah. space, yeah. then, yeah, yeah. then you can worry about Did they close the pools, by the way, well? in California? So, yes, that's right. I have not. I don't think so. I, I, I haven't didn't know heard. If they but closed the pools. What yeah. you brought up there, Richard, is there's another uh, uh, video making the rounds on on uh, Facebook right now, and it's of a spring ba- break pool in Florida, and it's literally lined wall to wall, kids butt to butt on the coping with their feet in the water, <laughs> dipping in and out of the water. So you they're they're at risk, but not because of the pool. The, the pool is just a. <laughs> It's not because of the pool. I think, Richard, that I've got a couple emails this weekend of pool service guys who are concerned if they if we actually go on a lockdown where you can't actually do your job, and if they can't get into the backyard to service a pool, and that ends, what, you know, the repercussions of that. And obviously, you know, you guys have already talked about this, probably algae growth is a big one if they can't yeah. get in to actually service the pool. Yeah. And then yeah. if the, you know, when is there a point where, you know, uh, and this is probably a long-term thing, but, you know, mosquitoes or, you know, other things that could potentially be issues. I guess that was a question I had via Hopefully email this Hopefully this thing's not well, going to go on I, that I long. Think I think that gets starting to be irrational if, if people are keeping yeah. – there, there's a set of service people who are would be riskier – compared to others right but the pool service person is not going to be the risky person in your household because of where they are servicing right the 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 i mean they're in the pump room and they're in the pool you know area but they're not going in your home and they're not touching so it depends on the it also if people are worried there's ways of uh, of addressing it where the pool service person can um you know, explain not only that the areas they're going to are not not as common areas or whatever and so on, but that but you know you can pool service person can do extra steps, such as kind of like what a, a house cleaning service does when they uh, wear gloves, which they should do not just for their own safety but for also for in, turn, in terms of you know not not getting sick or or making anyone else sick if they're sick. And by the way, there's a there's a video. Um, I'll say remind if you remind me and uh, send me an email. I'll send you an email too. There's a link of a video online that's a really good one uh, about house cleaning services and what they do with respect to, uh, you know, preventing uh, transfer of illnesses. Um, both, both, both they're getting sick because they're visiting all these houses, right? Including people that have kids getting sick and stuff like that. And they're transferring from person to person. So, you know, every house cleaner is obviously going to be different, but the ones that are, that tend to be more professional and, you know, do the right thing and as a group learn best practices and all that. Um, there's a video about that and it's really excellent. And the same principles that they're doing apply to what a pool service person can do. I mean, obviously not the cleaning rags and stuff like that, but in terms of the contact, uh, use of gl- disposable gloves, uh, things to do with respect to, you know, not touching your face as much and washing your hands regularly, all the, all the standard stuff. Uh, I think it would be useful for them to watch because if they watch that and follow those practices and tell people, tell they'll tell the homeowners that they're following those practices and then also explain they're simply not in the areas of the household that are, that are going to be, um, you know, where it's going to be at risk unless the person runs out to the, 
pool shed, you know, within a day or so, the day that the person was there, you know, and the pool service person wasn't careful and they did something and did fomites, you know, with, with, with secretions. Yeah, you know, it's that the risk is, I mean, it's really getting starting to get out there, but the pool service can do things, pool service person can do things to lessen the, you know, make people feel better and to legitimately lessen the, the, the risk that it's not very difficult. Disposable gloves is the easiest thing. I think the biggest risk is if, if we get shut down somehow and aren't able to get out and get to our pools, they could turn and then they're, then they're at risk of other things, but I don't think. There'll be a mess to, there'll be a mess to deal with. They're not going to be a, it's not quite as much of the health risk. I mean, there is potentially, depending on the season, the mosquito risk and such, it's mostly this, they're going to get, you know, they'll get algae is the thing and there'll be a mess to clean. You know what it's like to, if, the, if they get algae enough, you know, if you wait long enough and depending on whether they, you had the algicides and phosphate removers and stuff like that and copper, if you, if you didn't have any of that, they're going to turn more quickly and get, you know, worse faster. Uh, but when they get really bad into a swamp, you know what it's like. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mess to clean up. It takes a ton of chlorine, a ton of filtering, a ton of, you know, it's just a, it's time and money to fix it. And that, and that's one of the things about chlorine. If something has already turned, the chlorine doesn't go right straight to disinfecting. It's got to oxidize what's built up in the water oh, yeah. first. Yeah, you got to get rid of the algae first. Yeah, and it's got. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it just yeah, it, we we could our chlorine bills could go up. Yeah, maintenance maintenance of a pool is far easier than fixing a problem after the fact. You know that that is uh, for for algae particularly. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for all that. The the other area, if you still have some time for us, um, sure. that I wanted to get into is on the the Langlier side of things. Um, sure. There's a lot of exposure to risk, uh, and um, especially in the kind of pools we're we're kind of talking about, higher end pools with higher end finishes, and. Um, the, the whole uh, thing with the National Plasterers Council. So uh, knowing and understanding the Langlier Index is more crucial to a pool, pool service pro now than I think it ever has been. Um, so maybe uh, you can, are, are you familiar with some of the startup techniques and some of the, what do you think is the most important thing? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've been involved with the, with the uh, you know, uh, it's it's unfortunate that in the same way that the chlorine cyanuric debate sort of issues happen because of the the two um, uh, chemical type groups uh, in terms of companies uh, you know battling it out and such um, for reasons I don't understand a similar sort of a thing happened in the uh, plaster area with respect to saturation index and startup techniques and all that between you know on balance and the plasterers council. Right. And it's really, I mean, it's unfortunate in both cases that this kind of thing happens because it's really just wasteful um, yes. to, you know, but it, it, it happened and, and, it, ha and it, it looks like it's a little better now as far as the Plasters Council and the Unbalance in terms of getting a little more agreement, a little more common understanding and such. Um, so it's better than it was. Um, and... Um, but uh, I would say it's always really been important to have the saturation index in good case if you want your plaster pool to last a long time. Um, you know, it's just that it doesn't turn. It's not like it's not like the chlorine cyanuric acid relationship where, uh, uh, you know, uh, trichlor use can turn a pool within a year or two, depending on, you know, residential usage. I mean, if you have a lot of dilution, you can slew it out a lot, or if you're lucky, or if you have low phosphates or whatever, you know, you can go longer or whatever, and people don't have issues, but but it can turn like it did in my pool in a year and a half, right? And I had a pool cover. If I didn't have a pool cover, I probably would have had in the first year, um, if it was a full year season, probably something going wrong by the end of the year. Yeah. So uh, what I was uh, then saying was that uh, it seems better, uh, a little better now in terms of the uh, on balance versus plaster council in terms of coming to a little closer agreement, which is good. Um, but there's a difference between the plaster situation and the chlorine cyanuric acid relationship uh, uh, battle uh, in that with chlorine cyanuric acid, um, uh, if, if not properly, you know, balanced and, uh, you know, getting uh, algae growth as uh, cyanuric acid builds up uh, as I did in my pool with, you know, just using trichlor for a year and a half. Um, the, uh, 
you know, the algae problems can happen pretty fast. Plaster problems in most pools uh, don't happen that quickly because usually a saturation index is not uh, maintained improperly that badly. I mean, it's, it's maintained, can be maintained poorly, but usually not, it's not crazy. So it'll take years uh, before there's an issue, you know, but what that means is that instead of your plaster pool lasting, you know, at least 15 years or more, it, you're talking about it lasts five years or 10 years, right? So it's that more, it's more that level. Um, uh, or if you're really good at maintaining it, you know, maybe you can get a 20 year pool or something like that. Um, or maybe even more. And that's, that's a full plaster pool. And a lot of it depends on the workmanship of the plaster and things like that too. So it's not just saturation index related, but, um, but it's a longer term effect. Uh, the exception to that is somebody, uh, pool owners, uh, pool services, you don't, don't do this because they know better, but there's some pool owners that, uh, you know, may use trichlor and they don't use pH up. I mean, they don't check their pH, right? And then the, yeah. the total alkalinity crashes and then the pH goes down to four and a half or so, right? Or below. And that's where, yeah, then they start having, you know, their plaster starting to degrade and then you can have something done, you know, within months to a year or whatever that you can have an issue. So, um, but in most cases, the problem is much longer and therefore most people don't pay attention to it as much, but it doesn't mean it's not as important. So when you're talking about the higher end surfaces, what happens there, it's not that the degradation's necessarily going to be faster. It's just that it's more costly <laughs> the negative effect of it because right. of the cost of the surfaces. But the fact is, is that, you know, it's still expensive to replaster a pool regardless. So the fact that a plastered pool only lasts 10 years instead of 15 years because you didn't do the saturation index well or five years or 10, you know, or, or, or you really took care of it a lot and you were able to get it, you know, beyond 15 years, 20 years or more, something like that, depending on the workmanship and the saturation index. Um, you know, these are long-term issues and most people, a lot of people don't pay attention to long-term issues. Right. But, it, but they're real. Um, so yeah. 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 So, 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 so what's the question? So what do you want to talk about with respect well, to? Um, and this is, this is an area that I've, I don't know how far back you go with this issue, but the NPC uh, uh, did some study pools at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and the service industry, I think where this whole thing with On Balance and, and the NPC started, and, and it was also IPSA was uh, on, on On Balance's side of it, was that everything that at least what we saw published about their study was all geared towards water chemistry. There was, there was very little uh, attention paid to their practices, their mixes, their material selection. And that is the biggest bone of contention, I think, that goes on right till this day. And, it, and it's the one thing I think really has to, we, we have to stop this and, and get together and get on the same page so that we give yeah. a better end result to the consumer. But um, I, I uh, had a, a, a chemically automated pool that I started up, um, some streaks and white spots started showing up on the plaster. I had been monitoring this pool from the get-go. Um, it was right at zero on the LSI index, but the calcium was up around 350. The pH was, was up a, a little bit higher, but the alkalinity was down around 40 or 50 at the time they came. That's not necessarily where I maintain it. But they're telling me because of that alkalinity being low, that I was running aggressive water in that pool, even though it was totally balanced on the LSI. Yeah, that's just not that's just not true. The only the, there is a side effect from low alkalinity, which is that uh, effects of pH, you know, acid or base being added to the pool in any way. And I don't mean just externally. You know, the plaster is curing, so it's like effectively adding a base to the pool, especially locally. Uh, if your alkalinity is low, even if you're saturated, it's true that the you know, curing aspect of it, uh, you know, will have a greater risk of scaling, you know, locally at the, uh, on the plaster surface, if the alkalinity is low, uh, just because it's going to allow the, uh, uh, the pH to rise more um, and form scale. So that is true. But other things, 
other aspects of it are not true. I mean, it's definitely not more corrosive. It's the opposite, if anything, in yeah, that okay. case, because you because your saturation index was balanced. So you're not going to get more corrosive just because your alkalinity was lower. But what is true is with a low alkalinity, you don't have as much pH buffering. So the pH effects will be more exaggerated or can be more exaggerated. And this has to do with the, what's known as the calcium carbonate precipitation potential, but that gets a little more, you know, yeah. it's but also it'll run, but also because the alkalinity is low, it's going to run out of carbon bicarbonate too. So, I mean, there's that, there's the plus side of that. It, it'll be limited in how much scale it'll do. So it'll be more easily form scale, but it will be limited. It'll self extinguish because there won't be as much available to be able to scale. So it's, it's, um, but, but their part of it, their point is just wrong. I mean, there are, potential issues with lower alkalinity but they're not what they say so it's not that it's corrosive and, and the um, ph stayed very stable um the the dosing system that i had i mean we we're literally putting in le less than an ounce at a time every five minutes so the the was, that, was this a bicarb startup you did or something or what uh, i i do the the calcium startup uh, i get my calcium as the pool is filling up to at least 300 parts per million Oh, but it's but it's the principle similar in terms of it's yeah, having the saturation right. index be high. It's not an acid startup or a traditional startup. No, those those so that, have to go away. Those those damage the plaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah, I would I agree I agree with that. Uh, what what you did? Yeah. So by having the saturation index in good shape, what you did effectively is form a seal. Uh, you know, fairly quickly. This is what on balance talks about, right? That right. you form a seal of calcium carbonate fairly quickly. Uh, you know, and and that and therefore you stop bleeding calcium into your pool. Yeah, we have very almost no plaster dust. Right, and that and then if that's done right, then you not only have very little plaster dust, but you also have very little pH changes. You say because it's the the uh, it's not leaching in the hydroxide into the uh, pool. Instead, it's forming calcium carbonate in the surface, and then further and further deeper in until it stops at some point. So right. that that is um that's exactly the right thing to do. So in that scenario what I was describing about, you know, if it yeah. continues to cure and having the risk or whatever, that's just didn't happen in your pool. So your pool was yeah. fine. And yeah. the, the plaster council, at least from the chemistry point of view, is wrong in what they were saying. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So and that you know that's the other thing where there's I, I think a little bit of hostility is uh, that came out of the it goes all the way back to that study at, at Cal Poly. It is since that time we have been required to measure down to the ounce every chemical everything we add to that pool we're expected to record all of our readings and make sure they're dead on but when a pool is plastered i mean they don't measure the water that they're spraying into the hopper they you know they things are added by the shovelful by the handful um even on the same pool from batch to batch, there's going to be variations. And so it just seems like we're held to an unfair standard um, when yeah, it comes I, to that. I, I would agree with that. The calcium chloride content also is something I know that Kim has been, Kim Skinner has been, um, you know, talking about for quite some time and that that has to be done properly and not have too much of that. So my own pool, which is now beyond 15 uh, years, because it was put in in the 2000 four, three, sorry, 2003. Um, so uh, uh, now, so that's that 17 years roughly now. So uh, so at, uh, quite a while ago, about year eight to 10, I'd say, um, I started to have a lot of calcium nodules in the pool, you know, okay. and more and more of those. And the water chemistry was being maintained properly. You know, I was made, I was checking saturation index and such. And, and then I, and then there were some more, it got worse and worse. And then there were some cracks and then there were some, you know, and then more, more nodules and such. And then one part started to delaminate and then another part. And the delamination got so much that I was able to actually see, you know, like a gap between the yes. plaster and the gut. Okay. So at this point, and this was more recently, I, I had an opportunity to have Kim Skinner actually, he was going to be in the Bay Area. So I had him actually visit and yes. take a look at it. Uh, I had first before that had sent him a bunch of samples of what had did laminated so that he could do um, tests to see if the calcium chloride was too high and it wasn't. So the, so the chemistry of the plaster was okay. But when he looked at the pool uh, and he, you know, saw what it was and he said, well, the plaster is not thick enough. It's half the thickness it needs to be. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> so it was because it was pretty. I mean, it was pretty. 
anyway, so it was like, you know, so yeah, plaster and, and, and part of the, it wasn't just that it was too thin. The, the other issue with it was for the delamination was it was troweled, you know, too quickly, you know, it wasn't troweled carefully, right? In some yeah. areas, especially areas some that areas. had, had started to have slope changes, right? And so they obviously, you know, they created some gaps. Some of it's from, there's some settling, you know, I mean, it's a new pool. I mean, there's all kinds of issues that can happen, but there yeah. were enough things that were clearly workmanship related yeah. that, you know, and that I'm just, the only reason I'm saying this story this uh, that I have a personal story of it is just to give you, a, you know, a little more color to, there are all kinds of things that can go wrong on workmanship. And so clearly, you know, you, you want to have um, standards and measurements right. for right. the plaster workmanship <laughs> side of it. Just as you're saying, you want to have that for the water chemistry side of it, for the pool maintenance side, particularly in that first month, you know, when it's so critical. So that is, the, the both have to happen. And it is unfair yes. to just have it only on the, on the water chemistry side for the pool service person. It really, the, the initial workmanship uh, does make a huge difference in terms of the long-term, well, short-term also things that happen in the pool, but long-term especially. Yeah. 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 And, and so for, for pool pros that are out there, if you do startups or if you take over a pool right after it's been started up, understanding the LSI, knowing the variances of water chemistry, um, being able to document that you've kept it uh, right on, right on track um, is, is job one. And then I think it's really important that we start to learn a little bit more about plaster and how it's applied. And, and, uh, um, I think we need to have more crossover in terms of education. So we understand, uh, between plasters and service people, what each other is, is doing. Right. Right. And the pla and you know, uh, I mean, I don't, not sure what it's like everywhere in the country, but I suspect it's somewhat similar. And that is that, a lot of plasters, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how many use, uh, you know, more expensive, more highly trained people doing the plastering. I mean, in my experience, when, when we had it done, you know, you have a more senior people that are uh, managing it. Uh, and, and But the people actually doing it were, um, I, I didn't know how experienced they were. And some of them didn't seem like they maybe were necessarily experienced. And some of that right. might be try to reduce costs right so you know so i and that probably varies right i'm sure different companies you know some of them probably doing the right thing and and having making sure there's enough training and experience involved and if they do have somebody new on board treat it more like the you know that they have somebody else helping them and watching and and you know, just like you would in carpentry or anything else right or like electricians right. and, and the rest of it I, I mean all professionals everybody starts out and is new at something but what you do is you don't throw a new person you know, by themselves, you, you have them, um, have the mentoring and, and more monitoring, you know, in the earlier stages until they develop certain levels of competency. So uh, every trade, you know, is, should be like that. And it may be that in some cases, um, you know, that's not the case in some of the, some of the plastering ones, just like in some cases, maybe, you know, if they're not part of an organization and not doing like what you guys are doing, you know, simple service people may be like that as well. I mean, it's any yeah. trade. That's right. right. The, we, we all need, we, we I, Everybody I needs to be openly trained. admit Everybody, yeah. that, that on both sides of this issue, there are people that need to yeah. increase their edu education and, and up, up their game a bit. Right. And the nice thing is once, you know, when I'm exposed to these kinds of conversations, Dave, this is good for me because as an association and kind of as a leader, if you will, in education in California specifically, but in other areas too with the associations that I have, that we, you know, that I can actually take that and say, look, let's figure out how we can, you know, uh, offer a class or direct people to classes in this area so that they can get some training. And that's yeah. really important. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Well, Richard, we appreciate you coming on today. We know it's been a long, uh, you know, long podcast. We wanted to make sure we had everything in. Would you be? Would you consider be a, you know, being a regular guest on occasion? You know, because there's so many different things and, and myths and and just things that you can talk on that really help us out. So yeah. if there's a way for you to come on regularly, you know, every couple of months or something like that, we'll figure out a time frame. That'd be great. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy as you have uh, other topics uh, topics that come up. Uh, you know, uh, we mentioned, for example, spas are a very different yes. beast. Absolutely. So we can that. talk about we can talk about those in, at one some point. And then the work that we're doing on our committee, um, although it's early, so we wouldn't be able to give you as many conclusions, but could 
could, could give you some uh, other sense of things with respect to, you know, some of the accidental fecal releases and, and CDC reporting that, that we see from outbreaks and what that means. It doesn't affect the uh, residential side that much, but I'm assuming in the pool service side that your organization also has people that deal with commercial and public pools as well. Absolutely, yes. You bet. So it would, it would apply, you know, particularly in those areas. So yeah, sure, we could, we could have additional... Uh, and and we we may from time to time get some some feedback and some questions from our listeners, which we hope to be able to answer. So oh, yeah. we might, if you're willing to to uh, do that, we would really appreciate it. Yep, be happy to help you out. Fantastic! Thanks so much, Richard, for your time today. We appreciate it, and we will be in touch soon. And and we hope everybody in the pool service world doesn't panic over over COVID nineteen, yeah. and we can all, you know, coexist. Right. Right. And, and I, I, it's been a pleasure for me to meet you, if not in person, at least. Uh, or, Somewhat virtually. Yeah, yeah virtually. <laughs> uh, it, it, I'm, I'm really delighted. I appreciate what you've done over the years, and I and, uh, appreciate what you're willing to do to help us. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Richard. Bye now. Bye. A new voice in the industry. A resource for all. Education for you. This is Pool Pro Podcast build relationships, and share important news as we get ready for our next backyard adventure. Pool Pro Podcast. Backyard adventures are better together. Please take a moment to share, like, and review our content with all of those that would be interested.